Uh, my name is Nayan and uh, I have around 10 years of experience. I've been working with uh, Big Data Hadoop for almost more than five years now. I'm a certified CloudWare developer and a certified CloudWare administrator. So right now I work as a technical architect working with different various clients, trying to understand where their business problems are, trying to suggest them what kind of business solutions they can get in, themselves introduced to, and then try to implement the blueprint of the designs. So that's all about myself. I'm trying to help different clients understand their requirements. And on the process of understanding their requirements, I do get a lot of real time and real world feedback about how Hadoop world is moving, how Hadoop world is trying to achieve and what they're trying to achieve. It has been an incredible journey for me, guys. It has been a great, great journey for me, understanding what kind of potential problems customers face, trying to solve things in ways I can. Sometimes, you know, all these five years I've been seeing that there are so many different vendors coming in, trying to do and trying to solve problems, which we have faced in the customer side and client side. And now I can tell you very proudly that yes, Hadoop is right now in such a, such a position in industry where a lot of clients, a lot of people and a lot of technical entities are looking forward to resources like yourself who wants to be basically a person who can be counted on to be a Hadoop expert. So that's all we're going to do now. We're going to have a quick introduction about Hadoop, understand what Hadoop is, try to understand a couple of use cases and see what are the different scenarios where Hadoop is helping us out. And by the end of this course, by the end of this one hour session, we'll hope and we'll try to hope that all of you will be thoroughly introduced to Hadoop and plan to start your careers and your future path in something related to Hadoop. What exactly is Hadoop? You know, what exactly Hadoop does for us? And how can we fit Hadoop into our system? Will Hadoop solve something for us which we can, cannot solve ourselves? Or is Hadoop something new that will bring a lot of things into the plate which has never been thought about before? I tell them a very small, short, sweet story. And I'm going to share the same with you. In ancient days, guys, in ancient days, people used to travel from one city to another using horse-driven carts. You know, they used to sit on the horse-driven cart, they used to travel from one city to another. Life was simple and, you know, they were happy. As time grew, there are so many cities that spanned up. Traveling from one city to another, which were on two remote corners of a big state, was impossible. Dragging a horse cart throughout a huge area was quite impossible. On top of that, people's need grew. They had their families, they had their stuff to carry across. So it was becoming increasingly difficult for anybody to grow from one city to another using the horse driven cart. So somebody said, let's keep on feeding the horses. Let's keep on feeding the horses so that it can grow out to be big and strong. Now you'll all agree with me that no matter how much no matter how much you feed a horse, it can never ever grow up to be an elephant, right? It can never ever grow up to be an elephant. So somebody else said, instead of we having one horse drawing the cart, let's now have multiple horses drawing the cart. Let's have 10, 12 horses drawing the cart. And that is what is big data for you. Big data says, do not put all your eggs in a basket. Big data says, do not try to draw your horse with a single cart. No matter how much the hardware stack increases, no matter how much people are talking about RAM size increasing, network size increasing, hard disk size increasing, you can never ever feed a server to be as big as you want. There is no chance that you can have one dedicated server able to process, hold, and store all your data that your company needs. And that is where Hadoop kicks in. Hadoop says, we work in a distributed fashion. We work in a situation where multiple horses draw the cart. So instead of having a situation where we are limited by the processing and distributed capacity of a single server, Hadoop says, have a cluster, have 10, 20, 100 nodes connected to each other using a distributed fashion. And now when you have a distributed clusters set up within themselves, when you install Hadoop on that, Hadoop becomes a distributed computing process. So now when you have Hadoop in your system, it's going to give you results faster. It's going to allow you to do certain things which you are not able to do because of the restriction of the data storage, data processing, and data management processing capabilities. 
So Hadoop is nothing but a distributed platform that will allow you to do a lot of things which you cannot or we couldn't have done using traditional systems because of the limitations of processing or because of the limitations of storage capabilities. And that is what Hadoop is. All right. Now, a lot of, lot of you know, a lot of the clients they talk about, you know, what kind of use cases Hadoop can solve, or you know, do Hadoop really gives us a situation, or do Hadoop really gives us a, you know, insight about a lot of things? I tell them the same thing, that Hadoop is a platform. Hadoop is a way of providing a means to your solution. Hadoop is not your solution. Let me give you an example again. Imagine that you are maybe the managers of some bank. Okay, so all of you are managers of some bank. So what you do is you have a requirement this quarter saying that you have to find out the best possible location in your vicinity, in your city, in your state where you can set up an ATM machine. So that is a use case that you know you are supposed to do a business use case. So what you do is you have two options now. Either you go and set up an ATM right in front of your house. You can do that. You are the manager, right? But that decision would not be a rational decision. Creating an ATM right in front of your house will not allow you or will not make you a great leader because you are not making your decisions based out of common opinions. So guys, I have a question for you. When you have to make a decision, a significant decision like this maybe, what are the things or which thing do you think would be the most important factor that you will need for making a correct decision? Anybody guys, you know, what do you think would be a best suitable or best stuff that you can think about that will help you make a business decision? Or what is the first thing you need to make a decision? A lot of people are saying, you know, data. Yes, absolutely right. Any business decision that you make, any any business decision that you make is always bounded by data. If you have sufficient amount of data, there are high chances that your decisions will be correct. If your decisions are based out of limited amount of data, then high chances are your decisions will be quite bad. So yes, first thing you'll ever need to do in making any kind of decisions in your entire life, be it Hadoop, non-Hadoop, be your personal life, professional life, the only thing that will drive you to make a decision would be data. So what you do is you go to your bank, you go to your analytics division maybe and say, I want to find out the location in this city where there is a shortage of ATMs. You are the manager, you go to your you know, analytics team and you tell them that's what you want. So analytics team will say, I have to make a decision. I have to first gather the data. So what you will do? They'll say, I have a lot of data in my relational database. My database is where my customers are, you know, my customer driven database. I know their addresses. I know all the stuff that these they people need. So I have these RDBMS database. I have the traditional systems of getting the data. So you have a lot of data, you know, you have a lot of data, data from your relation, you know, relational world, your customer data, your customer address, you know, all those stuff. So you say, I have got the data. Somebody else says, if you are collecting the data, why not go and collect the data from the customer care executives? I'm sure a lot of people will be calling up the customer care executives and saying that there is no ATM in their location. So why don't you go and pick up those kind of, those kind of, you know, uh, data from maybe, you know, audio files from this customer care executive. Somebody else will say, if you're taking this customer care executive data, why not go and take the log data? Somebody else will be saying, why not go and get, gather all your Facebook data, Twitter data, social media data, where people are talking about that lack of ATM. So if you start understanding data, if you start collecting data, you'll see that there is no single source that will quantify as the single source of data that will give you all probable permutations and combinations of where you need to find out an ATM. Your question is, if you really have to find the data to make a decision, the data sources are so much varied in today's world, the data sources are so much diverse in today's world, that it becomes a challenge to find out, to gather the data, put it in a single platform. So there is no traditional way, there is no traditional systems 
there is no traditional mechanisms where you can process, load and analyze the data. And that is where Hadoop comes in. Hadoop says, we are a platform. You just name the source, you have any kind of source, you have structured data, unstructured data, semi-structured data, you just name it, you can dump the data into Hadoop. Hadoop gives you a storage platform, Hadoop gives you a processing platform. So when you have a storage platform, you load all your data, data from your audio, you know, audio data that comes in from your customer care logs, the log data that we're talking about, load the data from the relational databases, log the data from social media and Twitter and whatever you want. You just dump the data into, you know, Hadoop. And Hadoop says, that's not all. We are not only a data storage platform. We are a data processing platform also. So now on top of the storage, you can run your analytics. You can run your processing. You can run your analytics, you know, what kind, whatever kind of you know, relationships you want to run on. You can do that. And once you are running your analytics, you will be getting a set, a series of locations maybe for this example where you can find out that, okay, maybe ABC is the location which lists the most number of requests by the customers for a lake of ATM. And maybe XYZ is another another location that is not having an you know, ATM. So this analytics team will come back to you and you can make your decisions in a rational way because now your decisions are backed out by the data. Now the biggest thing is we are talking about a lot of you know big data, Hadoop world problems, real world problems. The question is we have introduced ourselves to a lot of new terminologies right now. We're talking about structured, semi-structured and unstructured data. All right. What exactly are these? Structured data, you know, you know, the data that comes from the relational world, all those CSV files, TSV files, all the data that you dump from your RDBMS are all structured data. Unstructured data, well, email data, PDF data, free flow data, all are unstructured data. But the important thing that we're going to cover up in this class would be the semi-structured data, the data that we talk about from XML, XML parsing, XML processing data. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So I'll give you an I'll give another example. Why is you know data processing or a distributed data processing is so much important? What is the advantage of having a MapReduce introduced for processing data on top of Hadoop? And what are the advantages we'll gather, or what are the few things we'll gain out of having a MapReduce way of processing? Imagine that. Imagine that I have a Shakespeare sonnet, a Shakespeare's book, huge book, of course. I want to find out total number of times the word the was used in this book. A book, I want to find out the total number of times the word the was used in the book. We have a lot of people in this webinar today. So what I'll do is I'll take photocopies of the you know, Shakespeare sonnet. 60, 60 sets of photocopies, 100 sets of photocopies and I'll distribute those photocopies to all of you maybe. And I'll ask you, go through the book and tell me the word count for the word the in the book. All of you will take maybe 10 hours, 20 hours, and come back saying that the total number of times the word the was used in this book was maybe 2000. And that is a time consuming process. That is that, that process of giving a copy of the data to all of you and asking you to process the data is not a smart enough, smart enough way. So what better way we can think about is instead of getting photocopies of the book, let me tear up the book into 60 equal parts or 100 equal parts. I'll tear up the book into 100 equal parts and I'll give one part to all of you. Now if I ask you to find out the number of times the word the was used in the book or the chapter that is given to you, you will do it in 160th or 100th of the time. And when you come back to me, all of you saying that in my chapter one or in my you know section one, I had 10 occurrences. Somebody said I have 20 occurrences and I can sum them up all together in 100th of the time. If you took 100 hours for reading the entire book and I've divided the book into 100 equal parts, you'll be able to get back to me in one hour. So that is the power of distributed computing. Divide and conquer. And that is where MapReduce is so much important. And that is where MapReduce brings so much more into the table. It gives you a platform for doing distributed analytics, distributed processing of the data. So let's look into you know, MapReduce. The MapReduce talks about a lot of components, a lot of components that you can use as a part of the MapReduce programming framework. So MapReduce is a framework we talked about. There are a lot of ways, a lot of features that MapReduce provides you. So if I talk about it, 
MapReduce started as a Google project. It was, you know, started off as a big table project where Google was using to, you know, page rank and index a lot of search results. Later on, the same algorithm was introduced into Apache Hadoop. Ever since Apache Hadoop has been shipped with MapReduce, is the only basic fundamental way of distributed processing in HDFS right now. Apart from other things which are not in Hadoop but in big data, but from Hadoop perspective, MapReduce is a is a way of distributed computing. What are the advantages? The advantages are it can be used for indexing and searching, classifications, recommendations, and analytics. So any kind of analytical problem we talk about, for example, you know, the ATM or classification. Classification in the sense that, you know, if I want to make some, you know, recommendations, if somebody is reading, you know, maybe Alice in Wonderland, do I give him, uh, do, I, do I classify Harry Potter to be in the same category and, you know, suggest him that he should read Harry Potter also. Indexing and searching, you know, think about Amazon.com and think about, you know, Best Buy.com, thousands and thousands of product categories and you can search these product categories in a blink. Talk about recommendations, you're going and buying something from a web store and suddenly you see a lot of recommendations saying that if you are, if you are buying a Rolex watch, you should start buying a Raven, you know, pair of shades and maybe you can get yourself, you know, an iPhone 6 or something like that. Recommendations specific to you. What are the features? The features of MapReduce would be a programming model. It provides you, it gives you a framework to program and distribute computing. Large scale distributed model. You can at any time you can, you can divide and conquer your problem. And of course, when you're talking about divide and conquer, it comes as a parallel processing scenarios. What are the design patterns? You know, there are a lot of design patterns that you can use for ensuring that these kind of processing can be done in a very, very small time. So summarization pattern, you know, summary of whatever you are talking about. Classification, you know, classifying the data. Recommendations, we talked about it, and analytics. All these together create your map reduced design patterns. And then we're talking about map and reduce. So a map reduce program has the basic two features or basic two parts that talk to each other, that basically combine and then work together. It's called a map reduce framework, a map and a reduce phase of it. And that's all about map reduce. So we have talked about it, you know, how does people do things that way we talked about it. So if you have huge amount of data, the data will be getting split up into uniform sizes. For each site, you'll be basically running parallel jobs. The one we talked about, you know, Shakespeare Sonnet. I have a very, very big file. I'm dividing the file into 10 equal parts or 100 equal parts and processing 100 equal parts together. And then I have somewhere to aggregate the data, a reducing phase that aggregates the data, that collects all the intermediate output and says, this is the final result that I want. You know, so, you know, this is exactly what you're talking about. I'll spend a couple of minutes here saying that you know, if you have a huge data, a huge amount of data, you know, like, like the way I said, Shakespeare sonnet, huge amount of data, you divide the data into equal parts. And when you divide the data into equal parts, you can process them together. You're processing this data. So you're tokenizing a line, reading the data, tokenizing another line, reading the data, or processing the data, tokenizing another line, you know, and reading another data, and then eventually you do a lot of business logic in there. In this case, a word count program, the business logic will be very simple, count the words. So you count intermediate words. You say that, okay, beer has occurred twice in this particular section. Car has occurred thrice in this section. So once you get them on the reducing phase, you do aggregation of the results. And then finally you get the final result. That's all you need to do. So we talked about it, the anatomy of a MapReduce program. It has a mapper phase, a reducer phase. And then, you know, the map per phase has a very, very specific way of getting inputs and, you know, outputting or creating intermediate outputs. Similarly, the reduce function, the reduce function will take inputs, which is the output of the mapper. So they are plugged in together. The mapper will get some data from your input data files, process the data, create some intermediate data. The intermediate data will be stored into or loaded up by your reducer. They'll do some business processing here and aggregation will be done on the reducer phase and then you'll, get, you'll be getting your final result into your exact you know, storage location or a platform which is supposed to handle this huge amount of data. So question is, you know, we've talked about it, but still the question arises, why is MapReduce so much you know, in demand? Distributed processing, yes. Distributed processing was you know, available even before we talked about Hadoop. 
Hadoop is not the only program that works with distributed programming, nor Hadoop is the first program that would have come out with a distributed processing model. But why is distributed processing so much important with respect to Hadoop? What is Hadoop gaining in its own architecture with the other distributed processing algorithms are not gaining? Or what is the difference between any kind of grid computing, any kind of distributed processing versus Hadoop? The answer lies in two basic statements. First statement is processing data in parallel. Hadoop has a way of processing each and every section of the data in parallel. Not only that, in case one of the sections of data processing fails, Hadoop will ensure that your data analytics are failure tolerant. In case a couple of your nodes fail, in case a couple of your jobs fail or tasks fails, the entire Hadoop architecture will ensure that these tasks are rescheduled and rerun so that you do not have to think about failure of these jobs. You do not have to think about failure tolerance of those tasks or you do not have to feel, think about the reliability in which the data processing will happen. And second and more important, most important thing is all those traditional systems, be it your you know, relational tables, be it your relational databases, be it your other distributed programming that you have that you know you might have heard about in previous you know classes or all, they always always ensure that the data is moved into the into the node which is trying doing the processing. They are bringing the data into the processing node. But here in MapReduce, we do the other way. We basically bring the processing, or we basically take the processing to the data. My data is available, my data is distributed. Now I take the processing to the data. I do not basically go ahead and change the location of the data. Wherever the data is sitting on, I'll process my program, I'll do my analytics only on that node which has the data. Now, what is the advantage? The advantage is in Hadoop world, we're talking about terabytes and petabytes of data. When you talk about terabytes and petabytes of data, it will become impossibly huge and a challenge for processing data or moving the data into your you know, programming platform. Instead, it's easier to move your programming into the data platform. And that is where MapReduce brings so much more add-ons to the table. Okay, so what are the components of MapReduce? MapReduce will have a client that submits a job. Of course, it has something called a resource manager, something that always will ensure that all your jobs that you're running is maintained, managed. All those management will be done by a resource manager. You have a job history server, it will take care of all your you know, application masters, it will take care of all your log processing, it will take care of all those, you know, ensure that your historical information about the jobs, the job run, the status, everything is maintained. You have something called application master, it is more like a local guardian. This local guardian will ensure that even if you have tens and thousands of jobs running in parallel, each job is dedicatedly handled and managed by a pseudo guardian a, a small application that is dedicated for a particular application or a job that will ensure that your job will never fail you do have the reliability built into this then you also have a series of node managers node managers are nothing but slave nodes nodes which will be actually doing the processing and then at the end of the day you have a container a resource management a resource pool which will ensure that whenever you are running a program your resources are managed your resources are monitored and resources are basically allocated, deallocated, and coming back into the pool. And that is where the entire Hadoop MapReduce component stack up. Okay, so the question is, okay, we talked about it. Hadoop MapReduce is a way, it's a framework for analyzing huge amount of data in parallel computing ways. How do you write a you know, program? How do you write a program in MapReduce? There are different ways of writing programs in MapReduce. One is the custom written Java MapReduce. We will be seeing a small demo short, shortly about custom written Java MapReduce. After that, you know, there are so many other ways of writing MapReduce. It can be writing some NoSQL data on an edge base. It can be some interactive text, you know, like Hive. It can be, uh, you know, streaming or, you know, data processing using Spark and Storm. It can be graph-based data processing like Giraffe. It can be in-memory data processing or it can be an, you know, MPI, massively parallel index data, or it can be a search data like Solar or Lucene. There are different different vendors, there are different different services and different different ways of writing and executing a MapReduce job. Whatever MapReduce job you write, all those MapReduce jobs are executed on top of the processing logic. So we talked about it you know, in the first, first couple of minutes that Hadoop is a platform that not only gives you data storage capabilities, the HDFS is the data storage capability. HDS, HDFS gives you a platform to store any kind of data structured, unstructured, semi-structured data. 
but it also gives you a platform for processing, multi-processing your programs. So whatever ways you're creating a MapReduce program, whatever tools, whatever techniques you use for creating a MapReduce program, at the end of the day, you can execute that on top of Yarn. And that is the beauty of MapReduce. Or that is the beauty of Hadoop as a platform. Okay, so what is the way of executing it? Pretty simple. First thing is the client, a client, will say that I have a job, like I have a Shakespeare sonnet job, I want to process it. Great. So this is the first request that goes on. The first request will go to the resource manager, the manager which overviews and oversees the entire management. The resource manager will now go ahead and create a pseudo guardian. He create a local guardian saying that for this Shakespeare's job, you need to create a job container. So this is the first thing. The application master will be requested for creating a local guardian. So a local guardian will be created. The local guardian will go back to the resource manager and say that, okay, I take the responsibility of processing this particular job. The application master will now ask for containers. The resource manager will say, hey, you know what? You have to process this data. You have to process these jobs into all those nodes. As we talked about it, the processing goes to the data. Instead of the other way where the data comes to the processing, we are bringing the processing to the data or taking the processing to the data. So the application master will find out where the data lies, where the data is distributed. And then it will start processing all those node, node managers. Node managers are nothing but your slave nodes. The application master will go to your node manager or the slave nodes and say, hey, you know what? I need to process all this data. The data that you have scattered all through your entire Hadoop, I want to process them. So the application master will copy their actual processing to the node managers. The node managers will execute them. And eventually, after you get all those processing done, the application master will go back to the resource manager saying that I am done with this processing. You can unregister me. Once the unregistering is done, the client will now go back and see the actual process data in HDFS. And that is a sequential flow. Any client who goes and requests for a job to be running or job to be processed in your entire HDFS or Hadoop platform will follow these seven steps to ensure that at the end of the day, you get your processed result somewhere stay saved into your HDFS. Okay, so we talked about it. You know, there are a lot of ways in which the data goes in. You have input data. The input data is actually divided into you know, chunks or the data is distributed across the entire system. You have some part of the data. For every single part of the data, you run the processing on top of the data. So you have a processing part. The part is called mapper part. The mapper part will process the entire data. Once you process the data, you have the data coming into the reducing phase. The reducing phase will process the remaining you know, aggregated data and the output will be basically saved into your HDFS. And that's what we're going to do. So this is actually, you know, uh, the over, overview of how we are talking about, you know, uh, Hadoop. Now I think, you know, we have sufficient amount of information about how Hadoop needs to be processed data, processing data. So we can jump around and go into our external processing. So we're going to do that. All right. So I have some data for you. We have an input data. The input data is a small core XML site, so it has, you know, I'm sure you might have seen what exactly the data contains. It contains a lot of data that's stacked up. with some properties tag. A lot of properties tag, you know, there are a lot of properties. The property is, you know, default name, the property is IO compressions. So there are a lot of tags. This is semi-structured data, data that we cannot basically understand unless and until we can parse the data. This is what the data is all about. We have a small program written. The program talks about how do you go ahead and process the data. So in the configuration, we say that, okay, you know, we have the start and the end tag determined by 
you know, with Lisbon and Beta Gym Science. We have that end tag specified by the you know, Lisbon and Beta Gym Science with a slash on the way. So this is what, how we define a pattern. By talking about a pattern, which will help us understand how to identify which kind of XML is the start tag and which kind of you know the, the tag is the end tag. Apart from that, we are basically talking about creating a custom input format. The custom input format talks about how to process you know, custom data. Talks about you know XML XML input format which can process any kind of XML data. The XML input format basically talks about so any input format you talk about, any kind of input formats will have two parts to it. One is the input split. Input split talks about what is my delimiter. Like here the start tag, end tag, these are the ways of identifying the delimiters. And second part of any kind of you know uh, writing an input format would be the record reader. The record reader ensures that I can read till that end of that particular delimiter. In case my delimiter is divided across multiple nodes, I have a way of remotely invoking the other node, gather the data, and feed the data into my mapper. So there are two parts when I go ahead, go ahead and write my own input format. So when I go ahead and write my own input, input format, I have to write at least an input split and I have to write my own record reader. The record reader here is pretty simple. It says you read from the start tag, but you end in the end tag. So I have to start reading from the start tag and I have to end on the end tag. Whatever data comes in between my start tag and end tag will be put into my key and value. So what, whatever data I talk about, all those data will be put into my, you know, in key value pairs. So the key will be, and the value will be, the data which is coming inside my key value pair. So this is how, you know, I, I ensure that I'll be getting all the data till I read the end of this particular delimiter. And then, I talk about you know what kind of input format I'll be loading up and what kind of an outputs I'll be creating. After I do that, I basically find out what kind of you know XML you know what kind of mappers and reducers I'll be writing, and then I'll be outputting the data into a particular HTML folder. So a mapper will be also the same thing that we talked about. The mapper will basically look into the property name that I will pass from my XM, from my input data, and then gather the, all the data. So it may be you know if I'm talking about reading all the data inside a property, then maybe I'll read all the content within the property. From within the property, I'll be getting the name and the value. I'll be segregating the name and the value. The name I'll be keep, keeping in my key and the value I'll be putting in my value in my output of the mapper. The reducer will also do the same. It will gather the key and the value and then it will put down the data in my HDFS. If we look into this, XML, I have a couple of arguments. I'm specifying that this is the input location where my input data will be loaded up. Exactly the same location we're talking about. We're talking about the output location. This is where we're going to find out our outputs. And then we're saying that we want to read the property data. So we want to read the data which is coming inside property. So we're going to parse the property. For each property, we're going to get the name and the value and we're going to display the name and the value. That's the use case we're planning to plan to work with. So what I'll do is, I'll just run it from here. And then I'll just wait for this entire process to kick off. So this process will again take the same route as we talked about. First, go and submit the job into the resource manager. The resource manager will go ahead and find out the application manager. The application manager will register with the resource manager find out the locations where the data is loaded up, go to those particular nodes and execute exact data, and then at the end of the day, you'll find out the data, have the process run, and the output of the data will be stored into your HDFS. And that's what we're going to achieve here. All right, this is done. It also gives us almost all those information, total heap used, you know, whatever you want to look into. It talks about every single detail that we talked about. You just read all this data that we talked about. You can go to this Hadoop system now.
you look into this, that's all we're going to do right now here. We're going to get the output that we're looking forward to. It says next pair key is what you wanted and value is this. Next pair key is what you wanted and value is what you need. Next pair key is what you wanted and the value is that it is. So we have been able to parse the exact XML semi-structured data, load the data using our MapReduce code, and eventually get what we needed to know. That is find out or create a uniform you know, data from this semi-structured data. Create a structured pair from a semi-structured data. So yes, and I'm sure you know, you'll be getting this sample code from Erudeka, you'll, you'll be getting it, so don't you worry about that. All right. So same thing here, as we talked about, if you have looked into the code, now it will make us even simpler and easier to understand what, hap was, what has happened. So every single data, every single data that you're talking about, input file, in this case, there was a single file, single input file. It got divided into input splits. Input splits are nothing but logic and divisions where the data will be divided into. Input splits will be basically worked on by the record reader. Input splits are exact delimiters. You know, start tag, end tag, the ne next start tag, and the next end tag. All those will be input splits. For every input split, there will be a record reader to ensure that the record can be read from the start till the end. Every single output of the record data will be fed into a particular mapper. The mapper will now get the entire data and it can process the data as it wants. Now we are processing the data, searching for key and value, and then you know dumping the data into the data. So yes, you know you'll be getting this sample data and this you know program. You'll definitely be getting that. No worries, no worries. Okay, so if you want to see another example, I can show you another example as well. You know, if you want to see that. Very, very simple program if you want to see. Now we have input data like this. So let's say this is some you know, sensor data, the data that's coming from some, some, some sensors. And when we want to find out what is the lowest data that has changed. So this is not an XML data, this is more of a structured data. So we have a couple of questions, so yeah. So Rina says, do you have one input split per mapper? So input splits are actually logical, you know, logical divisions. So yes, you can say that logically every single mapper will be fed by the output of input split. Or in other words, the input split will invoke a record reader. The output of the record reader will be fed into a single mapper. So every single mapper will be dedicated to this combination of input split and record reader because that is a logical division. Pushpat says, can we have some more examples of XML parsing instead of this? So, you know, we had only one XML parsing, but it, you know, I'm sure it'll, 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 you have got the idea about it. The idea is pretty simple, you know. Uh, you find out what is your start and your end. The start and end will basically tell you that, okay, this is how we're going to process the data. Once you find out the start and end, you can basically go and, you know, go and process the data on your input format so that you know what kind of data, what kind of data, you know, or delimiters you want to search. So your input split will tell you that, okay, I want to search till the end of maybe, you know, the XML delimiter. That's what my delimiter is. And then you know that you know, it's not always possible that your delimiter will be always available in the same block which you are searching because every single mapper is associated with a series of, you know, blocks. You know that you know, there is no possibility, there is no guarantee that the data you are searching in that particular block will always be till the end of the you know, XML tag. Maybe some part of the XML tag is in one block, some part of the or the closure of another XML block is you know, or XML you know is not another block. So this is where your record data will kick in. The record data will find out okay, you know, I have to read till the end of the delimiter. For some reason, I have reached the block end. I have reached till the end of the block, but I have not reached till the end of my delimiter. So the record data will now go find out from the name node that what is the location of the next block it will go to the next block find out okay this is the place still where i have to copy the data and move into the first mapper which has to process the data because if i do not read from the start of an xml till the end of the xml it will not make any sense to me so the record data will now go read that data gather, gather the information move the data into your you know first mapper which was supposed to be working on the start of the end of this xml data processing for that mapper block, do that, you know, gather that entire amount of data and feed it to a mapper. Now mapper will get all the data from the start till the end. 
So Napper is pretty dumb in that way. Napper doesn't know from where the data is coming from. That is the record data which ensures that no matter what happens, even if the data is divided into multiple blocks and my end of the XML is not reached, but I've reached the end of my blocks, even then the record data will basically go, consult the name node, find out the location of the blocks which is, you know, uh, which is responsible for storing the other part of the XML, read the data till the first you know, closure of that XML, read that particular data into the mapper and put that data as an input to the mapper. And that is where my entire you know, end-to-end -end XML process will happen. So the idea is pretty simple. You write your record data to ensure that whatever happens, you're reading till the end of that particular slash delimiter or, or you know, end of your less than sign with your slash. Pushpak says, if you have some examples, can you share that over an email? I'll try my best. Yes, I do have a couple of examples, you know, because most of the examples that I have are client proprietary. I'll try to get some data. I'll try to remove this, you know, client data or client, you know, interactions in that data and I'll send it to you. I can do that for you. No problem at all. Ashwin says, is it possible to write a schema against which the input XML can be validated? Definitely, yes. This is an XML driver to read from one XML tag to another XML tag. A lot of cases, I can tell you an example where you can talk about you know, email data processing. I'll tell you that. Email data can also be tagged with an XML data. You know, I have a two, a prom, all those structures, and I have an email body. So you can also relate, you know, a lot of formats of email comes as an XML. In those cases, you cannot just read all those tags of XML. You have to read the entire XML as a whole. In those kind of you know uh, situations or those kind of you know scenarios, we talk about whole file input formats. So instead of writing an XML processing record data, we can write a whole file input format. Input format that reads the entire container of the file. No matter if the file is divided into ten equal blocks into ten different nodes, you still read the entire XML and feed one XML to one mapper. If I have hundreds of XMLs, each XML will be fed into one particular mapper. In those cases, you can write an XSD, validate the XML when you read through a record data, validate it using an XSD, and then the output of that will be given to a mapper. That is also highly possible, and we have a lot of clients that have done that. So in, the, in those kind of scenarios, you have the ETL process and the data processing process plugged in together. So if I do not have the data, or if the XML validation doesn't happen in the record data, then I know that, okay, this XML data is not correct for me. No need to push it into mapper because I'll be wasting a lot of time processing the data which is not even correct in format. Okay, so we have talked about this exactly that's why I'm talking about a combined file input format in case you know I'm sure you have heard about a lot of you know small file problem in Hadoop. A lot of small files you create a huge amount of problem in Hadoop. So you can use a combined file input format. Text input format is exactly what you saw in this XML example. Key value input format, special cases where you can talk about a PSV file maybe N-line input format, which you can write your own whole file input format or a paragraph input format or any kind of other input format. So sequence file input format, which can be used for writing or, or reading all those binary data, you know, raw, you know, non-ASCII data, maybe, you know, Chinese character data, Japanese character data, or altogether an image data, or PDF data. Then you also have a composable input format. An input format that can be combined as a plug and play of multiple input formats. Maybe a combined file input format and then an inline input format can also be plugged in together as a composable input format. And then, of course, the DB input format. The classical case where you want to run a MapReduce code directly as an input from your NoSQL database or your you know, Oracle database or you maybe any other traditional, you know, traditional RDB database. Richard says, can I read any kind of file using MapReduce programming? Yes, you can. If it is text file, you can you have a lot of options. If it is not text file, non-textual file, then you can read it using a sequence file, which can be more of a raw file for you. Ashwin says, I mean, sometimes we are not sure if you need to read a specific input due to transfer errors, etc. For those, it will be easier to check if the input is in a specific format. Okay. So I didn't get your question, Ashwin. So the idea is, you know, uh, we do not use MapReduce to validate the, the consistency of the data. We do not do it normally in a Hadoop big data world. For those, we use an ETL process. An ETL process will check whether the data is correct or the, whether the data is you know, in a format that you can work on that. 
For MapReduce, it is all about data processing, data analytics. All right. Ashwin says, do you suggest using PIG instead of MapReduce for parsing the XML and loading it in Hive for analytics? Yes, to be very honest, I would suggest that. The reason is, you know, uh, when, I, when you go to a lot of client places and you say, I don't know, I want to do a lot of external processing, they expect you to write a lot of PIG code. The reason is very simple. 200 lines of Java is equal to 10 lines of PIG. When I talk about, when, you, when the client talks about effort estimations, when the client talks about, you know, uh, the total cost of ownership of the problem, when the client talks about maintainability and scalability of the problem, then Peak will always win hands down to a MapReduce custom Java written program. In that way, yes, MapReduce program is very good for learning you know, Hadoop, but when you actually go into your you know, processing part of it and you go into your client side, they expect you to run pigs because it's highly maintainable. The cost of ownership is less and the amount of effort it will take, maybe you'll, you'll say I'll take you know, maybe 100 man hours to process or write a MapReduce program. The same Business problem can be solved using maybe 10 man hours using big. So that is there are a lot of other cost implications when you go into a client place and start working on them. Ashwin says, any issues when performance is your experience? If you are very confident and you have a lot of experience working with Java, then of course MapReduce will work a little bit faster than big. But in case you're learning Java or you think Java is not your main full day, then no matter how much you know you think about because the PIG program will create its own MapReduce at the back end and those, those map, or that particular MapReduce will be an optimized MapReduce. If you are confident that you can write a MapReduce Java program which is more optimized than the optimized, optimal MapReduce written for PIG, then yes, your MapReduce will run better. Otherwise, hands down, that will, that will work better, it will perform better. Ashwin says, even when using PIG, you would need a custom Java program. You would not require a MapReduce program, you require a very, very small, you know, utility program. That utility program you can write, write in Python or in Java, your wish. But even for XML processing, I, I doubt you do not even need to do anything. XML parsers and XML, you know, uh, XML storage comes with PIG now. So that is an advantage. Sonu says, what is the difference between PIG, Hive and PIG? So there are a lot of differences to be very honest, you know. PIG is a data analytics platform. It is a way of writing MapReduce code. MapReduce is a framework. There are different ways of writing a MapReduce code. Pig is one of them. It becomes, it is a high level language to make life simpler for writing a business process and writing some ad hoc queries. If you want to write some analytics, better to use Pig. Hive, although Hive also does a lot of things, but the reason why Hive came into existence was not because it was an alternative to pick. The reason was a lot of people had a lot of legacy system. I can give you an example. Facebook had, had a legacy system. They had terabytes and terabytes of data stored into Oracle table. They wanted to move into Hadoop. It is easy to move your data from Oracle systems to Hadoop. Very easy. But answer me this guys. Do you think if I have 2000 procedures written in Oracle or 2000 queries written in Oracle. Do you think it will be easy for me to convert all those 2000 programs or 2000 queries in, in my PIG or I mean 2000 queries in my Oracle to a MapReduce program or, or to, into PIG? Will that be, an, will, will that be feasible? Not, not at all, right? My, any company you talk about, they will not allow you to say that, okay, I have over a period of five years, I've been using Oracle. I have around 2000 stored procedures and you know, SQL statements running on my analytics. Tomorrow I'm going to start with Hadoop. But transferring data, okay, overnight you can transfer the data. But for converting every single stored procedure and every single query into a MapReduce program will take you six months to one year. Nobody's going to give you the luxury. So the idea of Hive was, Create an engine so that legacy system stored procedures, legacy system you know, programs can be easily migrated to a SQL-like language like Hive, and that is the advantage of you know pick, uh, uh, advantage of Hive. Hive, the reason of Hive or Hive's existence was firstly because it gives you a way for the legacy system data to move into your next generation technologies like Hadoop. So it creates a bridge, it builds a bridge between legacy system 
and Hadoop. And secondly, because it is you know, SQL oriented, it becomes easier for people who are experienced with Oracle or other data, you know, database technologies to move into Hadoop world. And secondly, I would say, PQ is only for analytics. Hive is not only for analytics. Hive gives you connectors so that at the end of your data analytics, other people can get your data. So if I have done some recommendation engines, if I have written a code for recommendation engine, I do not want the recommendation engine data to be stored in my Hadoop system so that I do not share it with anybody. Hadoop world is an open world. If I run some analytics, if I have some analytics stored in my machine, I need people to connect to my machine and get, you know, use those analytics and show it in their UI. So Hive gives you that kind of an, you know, infrastructure. If you have run some analytics, if you have gathered your analytics and you have put your analytics into Hive, then any BI tool like Informatica, Pentaho, Tableau, anybody can go and access this data. Nobody can go and access your HDFS. It is not possible to go and access the HDFS, but it's easier and, you know, and, and easy, easy for any web application and a web service to go and access Hive. In that way, it builds a bridge between an external world system and your Hadoop system. So the idea of Hive was all about you know connectivity in the answer system to your Hadoop. Peak was only used for you know data processing or data analytics. Kunal says Hive is ANSI SQL compliant. Hive is not an ANSI SQL compl compliant, but people say that 99% of your SQL queries will be running on Hive. That's what they what they boast about. Rina says, can you use Hive to query data stored on HBase? Yes, you can write some SERDI logic. Uh, serialization, deserialization logic, because the way in which the data stores in Hive and in HBase are totally different. So you can write some, you know, SERD connectors, and you can query your HBase data using Hive, possibly. Yes. So guys, we are reaching an end of this webinar. You know, this webinar is now open for any questions you have or anything you want to discuss. Yes, this, this, you know, entire code. I'm sure you'll be, you know, you'll be, you'll be getting this code. But if you have any questions, please let me know. Sonu says, using talent also, we are doing the data migration and it's easier than when we use Coop. See, talent is a system, you know, that is, talent is nothing but a you know, bundled system. Talent doesn't come with its any tools, or talent doesn't give you with any tools, right? Talent internally will use a Scoop machine or a Scoop system or a Flume system. This talent doesn't have its own architecture. Talent doesn't have its own services. Talent internally will call a scoop method, or talent internally will call a NapReduce method, or talent internally will call your HDFS method. Talent is just a UI layer built on top of all those services. So talent doesn't have its own, you know, processing logic or any kind of thing that talent brings out of into the table. Now. Varun says, "Will you be sharing the presentation with us?" I'm not sure. I have to go back to Erudeka if they, you know, want us, to, or they want to share their presentations. I'm sure you know will be getting the presentations. Pushback says, how XML parsing in MapReduce different than DOM parsing and SACS parsing? Nothing different, Pushback. To be very honest, nothing not, nothing different. If you have seen this example, this, this is a very crude way of doing uh, an XML parsing. We are reading from the end tag to the, or the, from the start tag to the end tag. Yes, but because we are trying to gather individual components. But when you talk about whole file processing, processing entire XML as, the whole, and as, as a whole, then you can use a DOM parser or a SACS parser inside your record data. You can do that. Rina says, as Hive is a SQL engine, can you use it to query data stored in any NoSQL database? No, Hive is not a SQL engine at all. Hive is a service that works on top of HDFS, gives you an abstraction on top of HDFS so that you can run SQL queries on top of HDFS data. Nothing more than that. Hive is not a SQL engine at all. Ashwin says, what is the best approach to handle embedded images or audios? If you have some embedded images or audios, the best way is get the data. When you get the data into your map or mappers, you use some bitmap tools, use some third party libraries. There are a lot of image processing libraries available. One of them is bitmap library. Convert your you know, you know, information into bitmap and then you can basically process it whatever ways you want. But anyways, as I said, Hadoop doesn't give you with any library. You have to think about including third party libraries into your mapper code but that is possible. You can use bitmap library, convert the actual data into bitmaps and then parse the bitmap and you know, uh, run some analytics on that data. Vinay says, can you explain the difference between HDFS and MapRFS? MapRFS is, you know, see, 
a lot of vendors are now going into and pro providing your HDFS or Hadoop distributions. Cloudera and Hortonworks are the two most important distributions. Hortonworks and Cloudera, they both still use the internal file system, which is called HDFS, that's residing on top of Apache's version of Hadoop. So, but MapRFS, Map they have done an abstraction even on top of HDFS. So, MapRFS is nothing but HDFS, but they have their own encryption decryption logic built down, built up by MapR. Same with you know, the Cassandra file system CFS. A lot of people have used HDFS, and then on top of HDFS, they have written their own distributed logic, or SERDI logic, or some kind of you know, analytic, or some kind of you know. Uh, compression decompression logic and they have come up with their own versions but at the heart of the things all of them are same Ravi says do you have an example of parsing XML using peak right now I do not Ravi no not for this course at least for analytical purpose do I need to use programming language like closure Python to process data in Hadoop uh, yes, you know, you can use any of these languages, even Scala is supported now, you know, you can use any language, as I said, Hadoop is not restricted by the language you choose, it's all about data processing, doesn't matter which language you prefer, it supports almost a lot of languages now. Sonu says, I want to do analytics on dynamic data, what is the best approach? So, you know, the approach will differ, differ definitely on the business case. Think about a lot of ways, you know, think about NLPs, think about, you know, regular expressions, think about you know, uh, 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 classifications. There are so many different tools, you know, available now in the market which you can plug in with your MapReduce code or in any other data processing you know, logic. So it depends on from business logic to business logic. You now, yeah. Vinay says, when I have one GB of data stored into HDFS, will there be eight blocks? Depends. You know, if, if there are, if there are, what is the size of your blocks? The block size is defined in your, H, you know, in, in your cluster. Default block size 128 MB. If the default block size is 128 MB, then yes, one GB of data will be definitely saved into eight blocks. So does it mean the eight blocks will be stored into eight different nodes? Depends. If you have eight different nodes, then yes, eight blocks will be saved into eight different nodes. If you have three nodes or four nodes, then multiple or one node will have multiple you know, copies, multiple blocks. So there is nobody that can guarantee that which node or which block will go to which node. It all depends on the way in which the name node will ensure that the blocks are distributed. So the distributed algorithm is based out of only two things. One is which node is available right now, and second is all about you know how much load is already these nodes taking. So name node will allocate the blocks to all those nodes to ensure that none of the nodes or none of the nodes are having more number of blocks than the other. So it will be a dist uniform distribution of the blocks. Apart from that, there is no other logic written into name node that distributes the block. Richard says, can you explain the difference between combiner and reducer? Reducer, you know, it's an aggregated, you know, it, it provides of the aggregation of the entire project, of the entire job as a whole. Combiners are nothing but mini reducers. It works on the individual outputs of your mapper. So if you have, if you have 10 mappers running, each mapper output will be fed into a particular combiner. So the combiners work on individual mappers, whereas reducers work on the collective data from all the mappers. So think about it as an umbrella. If you have you know one mapper, two mapper, three mapper, it will have one you know uh, combiner, two combiners, three combiner. Now when I say one mapper, the one mapper will be you know map multiple runs. Map one, run one, run two, run three, run one, run two, run three, run one, run two, run three, and then at the end of the day you will have a reducer in case depending on the number of keys available. It's more like you know funnel you know where multiple mappers running. All those mapper runs for each individual mappers will be fed into a combiner. There will be multiple combiners running. The number of mappers is always equal to the number of combiners. And then the output of the combiner will be associated with reducers. So depending on how many number of keys are available, the reducers will be created. Vinay says, when there are 100 tasks running, if just one task fails and 99 completes, we will rerun the task. No, even if one of the tasks or even if 49 tasks fail, those 49 tasks will be rescheduled by the application master to other nodes. So in case, so by default in Hadoop configuration, you have 50% of tolerance. If 50% of your task fails, you, all those tasks will be rescheduled. So you do not have to think about that. The task will always be rescheduled. You can change that configuration parameter. By default, it is 50. 
But if more than 50% fails, that means there is some actual infrastructure problem. So you have to fix it otherwise. But yeah, if there is intermediate problem, you know, out of 100 tasks, even if you know 40, 50, you know, tasks fail, no matter. It doesn't that doesn't matter. You know, tasks will be rescheduled. All right. So with this, guys, you know, we are going into the end of the session. I'll maybe take a couple of questions. Vinay says, if it fails due to the problem in data, problem of data will never fail a program unless and until you have done some programming mistakes. Because when you talk about Java or when you talk about any programming mistake, data should not allow a job to fail. It should be a graceful exit. You should write your program in such a way that your exceptions are handled. Your data cannot fail a particular task. In that way, if it is, then you are writing the way, writing the mappers in a wrong way, or writing the reducers in a wrong way. Data cannot fail in the program. Okay. So, guys, I'll take a last question. The question is from Rina. It says, "Suppose I have 100 tasks and only one task failed." But I do not want the remaining successful 99 tasks to be rescheduled. No, no, no. If one task fails, only one task will be rescheduled. The, the, running, the task that got executed will not be rescheduled. Don't worry about that. Sonu says, how we handle exceptions or debug in MapReduce? There are a lot of tools available. MR unit is one such tool. You can use MR unit to debug your MapReduce programs. Exception handling, well, it, you know, it's just like Java exception handling. If you're writing your MapReduce in Java, Ensure the best practices of Java. That's all. Vinay says, I've heard pig joints are better than hive. Is it true? Not really. Both of pig and uh, hive, they convert it to a MapReduce code. So both of them will function exactly in the same way. There is no difference between these two. Rima says, is it possible to save the output from mapper and combine it to HDFS? Yes, set your number of reducers to zero, output of the mapper will be saved into HDFS. Possible, yeah. All right, guys, with this, we are coming into the conclusion of this. You know, thank you so much, guys, for the patience. We had a great and you know, a wonderful webinar. Appreciate the questions, guys. Rina says, if I have to have the reducer, no, the reducer output, is, you know, if you have the reducer also, then intermediate output will never go to uh, mapper. You know, it will be an overhead, right? It will be huge overhead because you'll be working about a lot of network I/O calls. If you're putting the data into, you know, HDFS for the intermediate data storage, huge, huge risk. All right. So thank you, guys. Thank you so much for the session and. Uh, Sonu says, where do we get this recorded one? I'm sure, you know, uh, Erudeka guys will, you know, they'll, they'll come back to you. They'll tell you all those details, the programs that you want. They'll also be sharing the programs with you. Uh, but I'll let you know, you know, in case I have any information, I'll let you know. But yes, you can reach out to Erudeka support. And I'm sure you'll be getting the recording of the sessions. You can also get uh, all those information that you're looking forward to. Everything will be shared. No worries about that. So guys, with this thought in mind, we'll, we'll call it a day. We'll call it today, guys. Uh, you know, uh, in, I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions, but I plan to see you guys. You know, a lot of you guys in the classes, the entire you know uh, courses, 30-hour courses. I plan to see you there. Maybe we can continue our discussion. You know, I, I want to see a lot of you in the classes. We can talk about a lot of things in the classes. You know, uh, that we, we we are covering up in Erudeka. Then we'll basically see a lot more examples. We'll cover up a lot of questions, and uh, you know. Uh, Yes, you know, so with this thought in mind, we will complete the class for today or the webinar for today, guys. Uh, yes, so, so I'm sure at the end of the class, we'll be getting a link uh, in a feedback form. Your feedback is important. And, you know, uh, all, I, all I can say is, guys, you know, have a wonderful you know, time. And I hope to see you very soon in some of the classes that Erudeka is running. With this thought in mind, we will close it for now. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much.